So good afternoon. My name is Nazo Qureshi, and it's been a real privilege um, to work with many of you here today in USAID's Bureau for Global Health, in our missions, um, and in partnerships with MCHIP, the core group, the Child Survival and Health Grants Program, and the Malaria Communities Program. And it's great to see so many um, partners here among us. Together with our esteemed Ministers of Health, who are here today, and right in front of me, um, we are a part of a global movement to support a range of partnerships with civil society organizations and communities to advance priorities in health, priorities that we have committed to just yesterday. And it is exciting to participate in this effort on a daily basis. And I have to say that the work that many of you do really inspires me and many of us who are working here at USAID. I will moderate today's panel focusing on MCHIP's reflection about how we can unleash the power and potential of communities as trusted allies and resources central to achieving our ambitious goals in health. Our collective commitment and current sense of urgency for accelerating progress is palpable, um, especially after the event yesterday. Whether to reach the MDGs in the short term or achieve universal health coverage in the long term, the energy is palp palpable, as I said. Uh, this commitment is inextric inextricably linked to greater investment in community health action and learning and must recognize a stronger role of communities in driving health outcomes. We have a tremendous opportunity to capitalize on this energy and momentum to help countries, to help our ministers of health, scale up community, -based, um, community health based on what we know today about evidence and an exploration of more inclusive partnerships that can be leveraged to support countries in achieving effective coverage of life intervention, life-saving interventions at scale. There is a growing body of compelling evidence that clearly demonstrates how community action rapidly improves coverage and strengthens local systems, including governance. We must make this evidence central in our decision making as we move forward. Our common, uh, our common saying, um, sometimes here at headquarters, sometimes at the country level, simply does not apply to community health. We know what to do, but we do not know how to do it. So please keep that in mind as our panelists are presenting. We also have an opportunity together today to challenge what we know um, and must ask, can we save more lives with a greater focus on investment in community health? And how do we make it happen with some of the things Katie Taylor was talking about earlier today, such as innovative financing um, and partnerships? Today our panelists will do both, provide insights about what we know and challenge us to envision a more robust future for community health. The foundation for our discussion today is the leadership role of MCHIP and its collaborators for community health. Wow, some of you are sitting way out there. <laughs> um, so as you heard Koki mention earlier today, MCHIP has supported diverse community platforms in 15 country programs to deliver 11 life-saving technical interventions. Uh, notably for integrated community case management and mesoprostol. It's improved the quality of NGO-led programming, and we have many of our NGO partners here, here in the audience today, um, programming and operations research to introduce and expand on a broader set of innovative community solutions, uh, and develop meaningful linkages for action and learning between global, national, and local actors to strengthen policies and plans. And MCHIP recognized that advancing community health requires a careful blending, the blending of science with the art of locally adapting, implementing, refining, and scaling up participatory processes to activate communities as resources. And Jim Ricca, who's, who's sitting here in the front, in addition to Koki um, Agarwal and Anita Gibson, have really tried to blend um, both the science and uh, what we know from practice in this document that you have, which is called Prospects for Effective and Scalable Community Health Approaches. So congratulations to them for doing, be, doing it so well with many of those who are sitting on the panel um, today. As one of our global champions for primary healthcare and community health, Dr. Carl Taylor wisely said, 
There is no universal solution, but there is a universal process for achieving an appropriate local solution. It's a profound statement, and somehow today's panel does not seem complete without Carl. So I had to bring his words in, and I'm also borrowing from his playbook um, with the word blending, because he was very concerned with blending vertical and horizontal um, approaches within health systems. So many of us remain inspired by the example set by Carl, and his legacy lives on in many of you who are seated in the audience today. So today, five MCHIP colleagues seated here all recognized leaders and champions for community health will guide you through MCHIP's most salient lessons that carefully blend evidence and experience to make a case for improving health systems bottlenecks with community resources and action. Our panelists include, first here, Melanie Morrow, from, who leads the NGO support team at MCHIP, Karen Laban, Executive Director of the core group, Dr. Ali Abdul Majid, Senior Maternal Health Advisor with MCHIP, Dr. Ishtiaq Menon, Chief of Party in Bangladesh, and Milan Kabadege, Maternal and Child Health Technical Advisor, World Relief. It's really an honor to be moderating a panel with all of them. Um, but first, let's welcome Melanie Morrow to the podium. Melanie has worked as an expert in community health design and measurement for 13 years in World Relief, USAID Tanzania, and ICF International, um, where she works currently. Melanie will provide an overview of MCHIP's role in, in advancing community health, guided by an evidence-informed framework for community-based primary health care developed by Dr. Henry Perry, who could also not be with, with us today. He is celebrating his um, anniversary of his marriage and honeymooning. Uh, so Melanie, please join us at the podium. Thank you, Nazo. So community health consists of working with and in communities to improve health, particularly of the underserved in both rural and urban populations. Um, MCHIP's contributions to community health um, have included support to multiple activities at the global and country levels to demonstrate how community health approaches for re reproductive, maternal, newborn, and child health services can be effective, equitable, and scalable. Um, this presentation is based on a global review of evidence and summary of MCHIP experiences by Dr. Henry Perry from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Um, and support to Dr. Perry's work is an example of the type of global leadership and learning um, that MCHIP supports. Um, additionally, um, MCHIP has supported work directly to its country programs and also provide technical, provided technical assistance to grantees of the Child Survival and Health Grants Program of USAID and the Malaria Communities Program. And 30 of those opera are operations research grants um, supported by the CSHGP in 23 countries, and the Malaria Community pro Programs were, op were implemented in 12 countries. Let's begin by having a look at a community health framework that was developed by Dr. Perry in consultation with the community-based primary health care expert review group in 2009. Um, it was based on findings from extensive review of both the peer-reviewed and gray literature. The framework reflects that in order to maximize health outcomes in the orange box on the right, um, First, you need to have a set of high-impact technical interventions that can be implemented and delivered at the community level. You need a delivery system for those interventions and various strategies to enhance community mobilization and empowerment to support and extend those delivery systems. These elements interact with each other and with the local contextual factors to affect outcomes. So this framework is based on the, the aforementioned review of the evidence and has been applied to MCHIP's experience in community health. Many studies have shown that community level health workers can pr provide preventive, promotive, and curative care. MCHIP and partners implemented many high impact technical interventions in the community that target corresponding life stages, some of which are noted on the slide. For example, MCHIP demonstrated that it was possible to implement advanced distribution of misoprostol during pregnancy for self-administration at birth to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. Essential newborn care was implemented at the time of birth. 
And postnatal interventions included postpartum family planning and piloting of community kangaroo mother care. For infants and children, there was community diagnosis and treatment for diarrhea, malaria, and pneumonia. And um, that's not to mention immunization, infant and young child feeding, and others. So turning our attention to the health delivery systems, um, Dr. Henry Perry's review found the greatest evidence for four major types of inter intervention delivery mechanisms. Looking back at the framework, we see those delivery mechanisms in the center box. And they are case management, home visitation, outreach services such as mobile clinics, and participatory women's groups. These delivery mechanisms um, are enhanced by effective community participation and empowerment. Integrated community case management by CHWs is an area of particular emphasis within MCHIP in the realm of community interventions. Um, in, in the area of global leadership, uh, MCHIP has served as the secretariat for the CCM task force, um, provided extensive support to UNICEF's um, ICCM evidence review symposium, supported development of the CCM essentials guide with the core group, developed CCM benchmarks and in indicator guide, um, supported a learning review of CSHGP projects with CCM components, and developed three country case studies and syntheses. That was in addition to the direct, the country experience in the nine MCHIP country programs with CCM components and 21 CSHGP grants. MCHIP found that successful ICCM programs generally use two different cadres of CHWs. Um, one cadre that diagnoses and treats, and this is often paid, and another um, that uses community volunteers that would typically be involved more in mobilization activities. Other success factors have also included a high-level political commitment and plans for financing and supply, supply chain management. So the second delivery mechanism involves home visitation by community health workers. And home visit visits make it possible to identify those in need so that to provide everyone in the target population with essential health education and targeting counseling on topics including infant and young child feeding, hand washing, um, birth spacing, prevention and care seeking for, for common illnesses, and also to provide key services, especially during pregnancy in the early neonatal period. And home visitation can take two forms. Um, it can be categorized as being systematic visitation to all households, um, or it can be selective visitation for um, targeted to pregnant women, for example, newborns, say, or sick children, or on referral and follow-up. An important aspect of um, something that home visitation allows is frequent interpersonal contact. Uh, there was an HP health policy and planning article authored by MCHIP that found that frequent interpersonal contact for health behavior change was associated with twice the reduction in under five mortality compared to surrounding areas. Um, and it's been found that a high volunteer to household ratio is supportive of this frequent contact. Now, when we think of outreach services to the community, um, immunization is by mobile teams is certainly one that is very well established. And um, it's been found to be run best where community leaders or community governance groups are involved. Uh, we also have examples of child health days or weeks and maternity waiting homes um, that were demonstrated in Liberia and health huts in Senegal, also as examples from MCHIP. Participatory women's groups can take many forms. They might use community action learning cycles. They could be based on care groups or other forms of peer support. Um, and they can be a, used as a means for community mobilization and health education, as the Momoni Project in Bangladesh demonstrates. Participatory women's groups are typically facilitated by trained health workers and provide the opportunity for empowerment and education on numerous topics and they provide opportunity for the, the members of the group to interact with each other and to learn together.
care groups are an example um, of an approach that's been widely used to ensure frequent interpersonal contact with beneficiaries, and they harness the power both of participatory women's groups and also employ home visitation. A care group is a group of 10 to 15 volunteer community health educators who regularly meet together with project staff for training and supervision. Each volunteer is responsible for regularly visiting 10 to 15 of her neighbors. In the diagram here, taken from a Food for the Hungry project in Mozambique, you can see that the, a limited number of paid promoters, represented by the green triangles, um, each one was responsible for, for training and supervising five care groups of community health volunteers. The, each volunteer was responsible for a group of 12 mothers from, from amongst the, the volunteers' neighboring households. And in this way, saturation coverage was achieved in the communities. And Food for the Hungry demonstrated that in Cefala province, frequent peer-to-peer -peer contact through care groups resulted in a rate of decline in childhood undernutrition at more than twice the national average at a project cost of only 55 cents per capita. And these findings were published in Global Health Science and Practice. And this slide has a lot on it, um, but the, I guess the, the main takeaway from it is an, an illustration of the iterative process that was involved in the scale up of care groups from development by one organization to adoption and implementation by many organizations in many countries. Um, and we see that the core group is featured in that big blue um, bubble in the center. And the core group, of, which is a member, an MCHIP partner, um, is a membership organization for organizations working in community health. And it provides a neutral space where organizations can come together to share lessons learned and create tools that support replication of promising practices. And it pr provided an important space and venue for the sharing um, and development of tools related to care groups. Um, there's, to date, there have been three validation studies that have been published on the effectiveness of care groups in contributing to improved nutrition status and association with decreases in child mortality. And learning continues through implementation research supported by the Child Survival and Health Grants Program. Findings from the, e findings from the evidence review include an increasing number of technical interventions can be delivered safely and effectively at the community level. Community delivery systems need to be tailored to the package of technical interventions. Community health workers are a promising resource for accelerating progress in mortality reduction. Frequent interpersonal contact is associated with health behavior change. And community capacity is associated with positive health outcomes, although th this has been little studied and could use more research. And then one last principle that um, was we would like to be able to emphasize and underscores what was found um, in the evidence review and was validated by MCHIP experience um, is um, that which was summarized in a, um, a Lancet article from 2008 um, stating that community participation is an essential prerequisite for better health outcomes. And this was certainly the experience with MCHIP. In the pre presentations that follow, <coughs> um, you'll be exposed to selected examples of MCHIP's experience in community health at the country level um, and in terms of product development. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Please welcome now Karen Laban to the podium. Karen has led the core group Community Health Network for more than a decade, fostering a neutral space for collaboration for more than 70 members with a presence in more than 100 countries. Um, Karen will discuss a unique resource developed by MCHIP to improve the performance of community health worker programs. And this was based on the most in-depth case studies that we know of, uh, of 12 country programs, um, really assessing what has worked and what has not. Um, and the performance of community health worker programs is really conceived of um, through both formal health support systems as well as community support systems. Karen. Thanks, Thanks Nazo. In 2010, Dr. Steve Hodgins, he was the technical team lead at MCHIP at the time, he had a vision to put together a practical reference guide to help country decision makers um, think through some of those thorny issues around large scale public community health worker programs. These are programs such as what we heard yesterday, the 850,000 accredited social health activists in India 
and the estimated 45,000 binomes and maternal health agents in Rwanda. Four years later, and we're just finalizing a 400-page guide. Why did it take so long? Because there is lots of information on CHWs, but they're not all in one place. Very little of the information available is about large-scale programs. It often refers to pri uh, pilot programs. And it's very difficult to access country-specific information on the history and evolution of their CHW programs. So we have the CHW reference guide now consisting of 16, oh, we started with the senior writing team of six authors from MCHIP, Johns Hopkins University core group and the Norwegian Knowledge Center for Health Services. Eventually, the writing team grew to include other specialists with the final product edited by Dr. Henry Perry and Lauren Krigler. The CHW reference guide is 16 chapters. Um, they're organized into four sections, so you can learn about history, governance, financing, a human resource section, CHWs as related to the health system and the community, and measurement and impact. The guide is not meant to be a consecutive read, but instead is organized so a reader can start anywhere in the guide with the issue that they're facing. How did we get this material? through peer-reviewed literature, gray literature, key informant interviews, and 12 country case studies. The CHW reference guide provides a lens to look at what has worked and what has not worked so well. It highlights that issues need to be considered as countries plan, implement, or expand their large-scale programs. Various countries have gone through civil conflict, economic disruption, political party changes, and they still have maintained a resilient CHW program over time. Case studies show that a high level of political support is needed, such as the prime minister's support in Ethiopia and the CHW professionalization law that was instituted in uh, Brazil. A CHW works within a system that spans across the health sector to the community and household level. So the CHW links the household and community to the health and system, ensuring a mechanism for universal health coverage. Many countries do not have one CHW, but rather have two or more different types of CHWs that often work together. It's a complicated set of relationships and interactions that really needs a complex systems management approach. One key informant stated, our failures have been more political than technical. We don't put enough energy into the political and governance dimensions of these large scale programs. Recognizing this, the WHO Global Health Workforce Alliance is calling for better harmonization of CHW system supports from donors, NGOs, and other stakeholders. So let's just explore a few ideas in some of the chapters of the, of the reference guide. A CHW program needs to be grounded in its context, both to deliver technical interventions that match the epidemiology of the location, but also to respond to the local culture. For this reason, this is not a prescriptive guide, but rather provides options and choices that countries have taken. The term CHW itself is confusing because it covers a wide variety of CHW cutters and programs. This guide gener generally refers to two types of CHWs, those that are mostly full-time, paid by the government, with formal pre-service training, such as auxiliary health workers or like the health extension workers in Ethiopia or community health agents in Brazil. Many of these cotters spend a significant amount of time at a health hut or a peripheral health facility. The other type is primarily a volunteer, part-time worker with much less training who makes household visits. We refer to these as community health volunteers, regular and intermittent. Examples include the female community health volunteer in Nepal, the NGO BRAC Shastia Shabikas in Bangladesh, relays in Mali, and the light duty health development army in Ethiopia. CHWs are often supported by NGOs. Decisions around CHWs will be different depending on which cotter you are referring to. 
CHWs play multiple roles, from community mobilization to health promotion, prevention to providers of curative care. Job descriptions include an increasing array of activities beyond RMNCH to include HIV, TB, first aid, and increasingly chronic diseases. Human resource issues, such as incentives, training, and supervision, will vary depending on their role and task. Some countries, such as Afghanistan, have one CHW that provides a wide variety of services, while countries such as Rwanda and Brazil divide up the tasks. CHW overload is a key concern mentioned in the majority of the case studies. Because of the overlap in the community system and the health system, different interpretations of the roles and tasks of CHWs can offset the entire system. For example, in one state of India, state planners thought the CHW should focus primarily on health promotion, but district managers felt the need for cur curative care. The lack of consensus disrupted the supply chain, resulting in stockouts that undermined the community's confidence in the ASHA. Data collection and use can help avoid this situation. Planners need to assess whether the roles and tasks are acceptable and appropriate to their target population and by the CHWs themselves and by those who support them. Most large-scale programs have supervisory structures at both the health system as well as the community. Incentives are a very thorny issue. Is the CHW incentive package financially sustainable over the long term? Are there previous CHW programs in the area that had different incentive packages? Tables in the reference guide help readers think through some of these important decision-making questions. Generally, a CHW based within the facility receives a package of payment and other incentives, while those working part-time in communities receive only an endowment in an honorarium or a package of incentives. The guide highlights some country innovations. For example, in lieu of payments, uh, in some countries, such as Nepal, there's an endowment fund for CHWs to access loans. Rwanda provides performance-based incentives. Cotters in Indonesia have received free medical treatment. CHW programs are not static, but they're always evolving, and they've been quite resilient as witnessed by changes in Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Iran, Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Zambia. The CH movement in the early 1980s failed because large-scale programs were hastily designed without the careful forethought and planning that the guide calls for. Programs need to be replanned at least every 10 years, if not more, to respond to the changing epidemiological and political needs. A successful community health program requires the support and ownership of the community, as well as the support of social and policy environment for community participation. Community structures, such as health councils, village development committees, and other governance bodies are key, as are the women's support groups, uh, such as those in Nepal, Mali, and India. This guide provides help in looking at how you can enhance community engagement. Dual CHW systems, such as the NGO Brock in Bangladesh, with its over 100,000 CHWs, complement the government's program. It's challenging to include a local participatory structure for governing a CHW program within a large-scale system. And there's few sustained examples of this without resources devoted to training and supervisory support, a role often conducted by NGOs. Formal local governance structures, such as elected local government councils, may, be need, may need to be relied on, such as those in Peru. CHW programs are not a stopgap solution. They need a long-term financing strategy and behavior change at the household and community level is what CHWs excel at, but costs for proper training, supervision, and job aids are needed. The guide is available online at MCHIP in downloadable chapters with other CHW resources. We hope it will be useful to the ministries of health as they evolve their large-scale programs. While acknowledging that large-scale CHW programs are complex to manage, the authors firmly believe that the challenges of a CHW program can be met 
and that CHWs will become part of a permanent, part of a highly functional and effective first class health system. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Please welcome Dr. Ali Abdul Majid to the podium. Dr. Ali has worked as a public health expert to strengthen health and community systems for a wide range of health interventions for more than two decades. Ali will discuss the SMART project in Egypt, which targeted interventions through community developed associations, which have a long history uh, in Egypt. community-based intervention. Um, Egypt have achieved a notable uh, improvement uh, with the decline of the maternal and child mortality over the last two decades. However, many challenges remain, including the persistence of the uh, chronic malnutrition for the children, where the stunting is increasing from 2005 from 23% uh, to 29% in 2008. Also, the uh, infant mortality rates also decreased, but still the uh, newborn mortality is uh, 16 per uh, 1,000 life births considered to contributed 58% of the uh, mortality of uh, children under five. So with this in mind, the project in Egypt was set with a goal to accelerate the reduction of maternal and newborn and child mortality, focusing on uh, nutrition practices and change it. That's where in line with the USAID strategies in Egypt. So the project put in consideration during design on the three principles. The first one, is uh, uh, to advance interventions that are uh, evidence-based, that's simple, that could be uh, replicated and could be scaled up. The second principle is to strengthen the, the community development associations to uh, take the responsibility to their uh, community through sustainable activities. And the third principle is to empower women, men and the communities to, uh, with, this, with the knowledge and skills to take responsibility also to achieve their own health goals. This uh, drawing showing some of the activities that the community health workers are doing in the villages about the hand washing and uh, 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 preparing the, uh, the, <coughs> the food uh, in the villages. The SMART project was actually uh, a short time project. It was two and a half years, all in all. And uh, it was not only uh, a normal uh, time in the history of Egypt. It was post coming to the post of the revolution uh, with a lot of uh, uh, un unrest and, uh, in, the, in the state and uh, political and also insecurities problem. So the community uh, uh, based implementation part was already done in 14 months from November 2012 until December 2013. So this is a busy uh, slide. I'm just uh, uh, going to uh, focus on the part related to with, uh, uh, with a red uh, uh, square. This is a, uh, it is the frame of the uh, project that working on the, uh, on the community, where the left side is the technical focus, in the middle part is the core approach, and the right side is the uh, geographical coverage. So the technical focus was the four areas of maternal health and newborn health in uh, family planning and child spacing and infant and young child uh, 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 nutrition. That was carried out through an implementation through 112 community development associations that were already there is a, uh, in, in the middle part here will show that is one umbrella CDA at each district. And uh, this umbrella CDA will going to support and supervise from five to 10 uh, community development associations uh, in five to 10 uh, villages. 
and each of these uh, com uh, local uh, community development association uh, hired and trained 12 community health workers. So the total was like uh, uh, 1,200 community health workers that they are providing the interpersonal communications uh, campaigns uh, to a population here. The coverage is 2 million of the population in 100 villages in the six governorate of Egypt. So these community health workers, they are uh, uh, having a lot of work to do and they were focusing on the, uh, the continuum of care within the first 1,000 day of life, starting from conception until the, uh, the two years of life. They, they, they did uh, home visits, group antenatal care, uh, they did uh, uh, improvement of, uh, of health and awareness of, the, of women, they did the postpartum uh, home visits uh, for counseling and for referral. Uh, they did a community growth monitoring promotion for all uh, kids under two years of, uh, of age in all of these uh, 100 uh, villages. And also they uh, conducted dialogue sessions with men and women. So uh, for some of the selected achievement based on the end line survey, then I will just go uh, uh, on uh, a couple of, uh, of uh, of indicator that's related to the knowledge, improved knowledge uh, of change, and some uh, indicators also related to change in practice and behavior. So the, for increased uh, knowledge of uh, women knowing about the danger signs after delivery, there was a substantial increase in the uh, uh, intervention areas, which is shown here by the uh, yellow bar. Uh, in comparison with the uh, control areas which shown here by the uh, uh, blue bars. And that is the right side is a lower Egypt and the left side is upper Egypt. So the second uh, uh, indicator was showing the, sta the, the same trend of changing of knowledge uh, of women of the danger signs of newborn uh, illnesses with uh, uh, a profound change uh, of improvement in the upper Egypt in the intervention area. Uh, for behavior uh, changes uh, 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 indicators, found that it's the antenatal care for four plus visits increased among women in uh, upper Egypt and lower Egypt in the intervention areas and in comparison uh, 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 as well, but it is very profound in the uh, interventions area. Other, uh, uh, other indicator related to increased consumption of 90 plus iron folic acid tablet during pregnancy uh, showed uh, across both sides, all uh, sites of intervention, so lower Egypt and upper Egypt. However, there was some inconsistent improvement of initiation of the breastfeeding within one hour of pregnancy. That was already, uh, while it is increased uh, to, uh, in upper Egypt, but in lower Egypt it was already, there is no significant change, either for the intervention area or for uh, the baseline uh, area, uh, uh, the uh, comparison area, and part of that maybe it is included, uh, uh, is could be explained by the, that the level of the cesarean section delivery in, in lower Egypt is really very staggering high, above 50 percent, and that's why uh, could be affected the, the woman initiation of breastfeeding. Also, uh, one of the good uh, results coming out from uh, that to show that the change of the uh, practices of mothers for their children under two uh, uh, years of age, that to feed them uh, four plus group uh, of the food group uh, in a day that was already increased in both lower Egypt and in upper Egypt. One of the uh, indicators related to the joint decision between uh, men and their wives that show there is a, a good improvement uh, for using uh, family planning methods uh, in Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. However, in the use of the modern family planning methods itself, it was showing here the impact of the commodity insecurity, while during the time in Egypt was the, the Minister of Health was not working that uh, as well with, uh, with the problem of security in the country. So, Although that you will find in, in Upper Egypt, it is uh, 
uh, reduced the use of the uh, modern uh, family planning methods by uh, 6% in, uh, in the interventions, but also it reduced by 15% in the uh, control areas. So capacity building program, it was one of the things that we uh, worked on it and it paid off a lot of uh, uh, program uh, for strengthening their capacity uh, of those 112 uh, uh, CDAs worked out and uh, the CDA leveraged non-USCID funds uh, totaling 7.3 million US dollars to implement another project, either they will going to use the same model of, uh, of SMART or they are using uh, the fund for implementing another health-related uh, project. We learned from that many things, but one important thing was that was even with the very limited time, with the problem of the country is not un, uh, completely settled, uh, and with support of the uh, uh, MCHIP SMART, that the CDA were able to build upon their existing relationship with the communities uh, to promote the healthy behavior and the change of nutritional practice, which is very difficult, and to work with the local government uh, to complement the provision of services and to empower community health workers in their work as they are agents for change. I would like to thank a lot of people that they did work back in Egypt on this project. Uh, very hard for this uh, two, uh, two and a half years in a difficult situations, and they uh, achieve a lot of uh, results. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Majid. Please welcome Dr. Ishtiaq Menin to the podium. Dr. Ishtiaq has been instrumental in shaping maternal and neonatal health policies and implementing programs in Bangladesh and has worked with the Johns Hopkins University and the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research for more than two decades. Dr. Ishtiaq will discuss how the Mamoni Project in Bangladesh addresses, addressed inequitable coverage of skilled attendance at birth by supporting community engagement in local health systems. Thank you, Nazo. Uh, good afternoon, once again, uh, esteemed colleagues. Uh, many of you may remember uh, back in 2012, uh, when uh, during the launching meeting of uh, Promise Renewed Call for Action at uh, the Georgetown University, while speaking at the panel uh, of civil society along with Bishop Sunday, I uh, tried to give uh, just a hint of a story of community engagement in Bangladesh. I couldn't detail the story then. Today, I'm gonna tell you that story of community empowerment and community involvement within the context of health systems. Today are the pleasures of it. The government of Bangladesh, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, has established 13,500 community clinics throughout the country. These community clinics are built on community donated lands. And the government has recruited, deployed, and trained 13,500 community healthcare providers for each of these clinics. And these clinics are managed by a group of uh, community representatives, and they are connected uh, with community support groups, as Melanie has said, groups of males, groups of females. And these groups are very much engaged in the management of those clinics. To us, this is a fundamental shift in paradigm when the national policy is accepting that in the health systems, the community's role is very much intrinsic and it's an integral part of the overall system. And the ministry has done a very good job in investing and setting up this huge setup in a short period of time. USAID funded MCHIP Mamoni project, which I work for, actually has been working with the Ministry of Health for the last several years to operationalize and to activate the community engagement part of it. We were developing a model in certain underperforming districts of Bangladesh, and I'll be giving an example of one of the most mature districts out there. In this ecological model, the household is seen as an integral part of the health systems. And as you are familiar with the rural settings in, in all over the world, households in the rural settings in particular do not work in or do not operate in isolation. They're very much part of a larger community, which is nothing but a, a, a collection of the households coming together. Now this coming together is what 
I'm going to focus today. Let's start with the households. The lady on your right is a community health worker, and she's a local recruit. And there are plenty of community health workers recruited by the government and by the NGOs in Bangladesh. These community health workers every day are going to the households, working with the households, and counseling them, educating them, and providing them basic supplies and services. In this picture, the lady in the middle is not a community health worker. Rather, she is a fem female family member who has just learned from her community health worker how to dry and wrap a newborn to ensure thermal care. So this is the example of transfer of skill from the community to the community. And this lady health worker is not in her jeans or not putting on a life jacket, but she, sing, she is crossing this bridge every day and 24 hours she is serving the community. And she has become herself a bridge between the health systems and the community. Without people like her, we couldn't reach the unreachables. So these households are actually, when they come uh, to meet at the community support groups every month, actually we see the power and the strength of the collectiveness. And this collectiveness actually helps them to interact and help the health systems to be stronger. In the area that we are talking about, we have been working with the Ministry of Health to develop about 4,000 community support groups and a huge network of about 12,000 community volunteers. And these community volunteers are unpaid volunteers. These community support groups actually, when they come together, they discuss their own health issues. They try to help each other. They, they tend to learn from each other. And in most cases, these community support groups have the local community health worker, government community health worker, as their members. And many of these groups actually accumulate voluntary funds to help those who need them. And these support groups are led by community volunteers, their own representatives. They use simple tools like hand-drawn maps to find out who are left out. They have used it very successfully in EPI program in Bangladesh. These support groups are very diverse and inclusive. There are groups of exclusive female groups, there are exclusive male groups, and there are mixed groups where males and females come together. And this is the feature of changing Bangladesh. And when these groups come together, actually the sense, the hype, is to take responsibility, to reach out, to reach out to help, and to reach out to grab help. This is the example of a community-led, community-operated transport system. And these transport systems are often done by the community volunteers. This is a community volunteers who is painting a, a Ministry of Health's community clinic. This is a very simple, small task. But what is more important is the ownership. This is our clinic. So we have talked about households and the communities. What is the most important value addition of our model is that to make sure that these entities are interacting in between. Without this active interfacing and interaction, the community's role cannot be institutionalized and that cannot strengthen the health systems. As I have told before, the members of the households in the community, every month they meet in the community support groups meeting. From those meetings, they send their representatives, the community volunteers, to meet the government health workers, the health assistants and the family welfare assistants. And this is the community micro planning meeting. Why it's micro? Because in the small catchment area, they check status of every eligible couple, every pregnant woman, every newborn, every child, to make sure that all of them, even those who are reaching in the outs living in the outskirts, they're receiving their services and the commodities. They help each other. And also, more importantly, this interaction creates an informal accountability framework. The service provider every month is facing their service recipients. And this relationship is not antagonistic. This is very much amicable and very much win-win. From these meetings, a monthly action plan is generated, which then goes to the local MOH manager, as well as to the local government standing committee, who then feeds it back to the health systems. This is a very simple innovation that gives us a big dividend. This is a typical photograph of a community microplanning meeting. The gentleman in the white shirt is a Ministry of Health, health assistant 
who is interacting with the community volunteers coming from different corners of the community. This is the local government standing committee who is actually discussing the action plan to find out solutions. Now all these meetings, all these interactions, are they resulting into something tangible? One fine morning, to act on the action plan generated, one of the local government representatives mobilized 400 plus community people to build this access road to a health center. And this access road has been built with the own resources of the local government to reach the health center you are seeing at the far. This is more serious, as they have done in the case of community clinics, in the very remote, hard to reach areas of Hobigons, the community has donated one third acres of land for each of the seven health centers, three, three storied health centers to be built. Government uh, provided technical support, providing human resource support, providing logistics support, the community donating their lands, private funds were mobilized for construction. Now somewhat abstract concept of partnership is very much coming to a reality in this resource constraint situation. Now the big question, so what question? Is it working? Is it strengthening the health system? Is it making the system more responsive? Is it changing people's life? I'm giving you just a few examples. This chart shows the community utilization by mothers and newborns, the district referral healthcare center. And it's so obvious that people, more and more people are coming to the district health centers as a result of the community engaged transport system. This chart shows proportion of women who had antenatal care checked up. In an 18 months period, we have seen in the entire district there is a six percentage point increase overall. But when we broke it down by sub-districts, we found that the increase was even more in the hard to reach difficult areas. So this gives, gives us an indication that community engagement provides a very effective solution to addressing geographical inequity. These are some of the um, key indicators, contraceptive modern method prevalence, antenatal care seeking, facility delivery, all are taking up very quickly. And as an example, in the long acting permanent method, the community volunteers actually contributed towards referral of 20% of the total achievement of long acting and permanent methods. We counted for maternal deaths. In 2012, there were 116 maternal deaths. And in, in 2013, the deaths came down to 87. When we projected the maternal mortality ratio from 217, it came down to 167. And it was in the baseline from the national survey for the region was 425 five years back. So the simple lesson learned, the community engagement can unleash the potential of the community and it can remove the bottlenecks of the health systems as well as mobilize local resources. What we have learned more importantly is that if you want to look at the health systems using the six building blocks, you have to look at it from two different perspectives, from the top, as well as from the bottom, using the community lens. Otherwise, if you don't do both, you're going to miss the better half of it. And if you want to do a learn how to do it, on behalf of our uh, very dynamic health secretary, the Ministry of Health and senior officials of the ministry, I welcome all of you to Bangladesh. Come and see it for yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ishtiaq. Um, before Milan, uh, we welcome Milan to come up to the podium. Could I please have a time check um, to see whether we are breaking at 12.50? We are, no. Okay. Um, so please welcome Milan Kabadege to the podium. Milan guides programming and research as an advisor for Rwanda, Burundi, and DRC, and has worked with World Relief for more than a decade. Milan will discuss how a consortium of NGOs Concern Worldwide, World Relief, and the International Rescue Committee supported the scale-up of integrated community case management in Rwanda. Welcome. Thank you, Michael. Michael. I'm very glad to present and to share with you the 
experience of Kabehomana project in Rwanda. Kabehomana project means life for a child. The project received funding from the USID Child Survivor and Health Grant Program and was implemented from 2006 to 2011 by three international NGOs concerned worldwide, the International School Committee and the World, and the World Relief in close partnership with the Minister of Health of Rwanda. The project supported the Minister of Health to scale up integrated community case management of malaria, diarrhea, and pneumonia in six of Rwanda's 30 districts, covering one fifth, one fifth of the country. The project have addressed the common the most common causes of mortality in children under five and by increasing access to treatment, by increasing coverage of key preventive intervention and by adoption of key family health practices. The project district were home to nearly 1.7 million people representing about 18% of the country's total population and reached more than 600,000 households of children under five by regular home visit. Kawehomwana helped the Minister of Health to train and to support over than 6,000 community health workers according to the national guidelines. Kabehomwana also trained over, supported the Minister of Health to train over 13,000 community health workers from different cadres to mobilize the community, the community and to conduct monthly home visit. At the time of the project, there were only four community health workers per village. Each community health worker was responsible for the entire village and focused on the technical area of speciality. Emphasis was on treatment more than disease prevention via household behaviors. The community health workers benefited from a system of performance-based financing and participating in community health worker cooperative that operate at the level of the health center. Three, there are many challenges to implementing large-scale community health uh, programs that include ICCM, but three, in particular revolve around supervision, balancing treatment with preventive health education and integration of services. With approximately 50 to 150 community health workers per pertaining to each health center for ICCM alone, Supportive supervision was a big challenge at, for health center. More recently, additional health center staff began to support integrated community health worker supervision. Learning from the traditional care group model, Kabehomwana had piloted community health worker peer support group as it is the primary strategy for community mobilization and behavior change in Rwanda. 
the project formed 660 community health workers via support groups, including more than 15,000 community health workers across six districts. These groups consisted of 15 to 20 community health workers from two to four neighboring villages who met at least one summer for training on health topics, on health promotion, for joint planning of home visit, and also to compile monthly report. The community health worker cell coordinator was elected by his or her peers to support health center staff in community health worker supervision. This position was created by the project and later scaled up nationally to support ICCL. There are many benefits of community health worker peer support group bringing together the different cadres of community health workers into peer support group and cross-training them in social and behavior change communication enabled them to divide up households to better integrate prevention and treatment to work as a team and also to achieve good results. The project conducted baseline and endline household service. On this slide, you can see significant improvement in treatment seeking and or care for children with suspected malaria and pneumonia. And you can see also that the use of ORT and zinc for diarrhea improved. Health promotion was not forgotten. While national focus was on CCM, the project also strengthened promotion of key behave, household behaviors in the six districts. This included hand washing, continued feeding during illness, and increased liquid during diarrhea, among others. Reanalyzing DHS data at the district level allowed for comparison of key treatment seeking indicators in project versus non-project district. While there were notable improvements across all districts, the analysis showed that the improvement were significantly greater in the Kabehomwana supported district. The reanalysis also showed that under five mortality decreased even more in the Kabehomwana supported district than in districts not supported by the project. Strong leadership from the Minister of Health of Rwanda has already facilitated national scale up of ICCM in Rwanda. The project directly supported the Minister of Health to implement activity in its community health strategy. That is important for sustainability. Innovative solutions such as community health worker, cell coordinator for peer support, peer supervision fit within the existing Minister of Health Infrastructure, it is now implemented nationally. The use of community health worker peer support groups to strengthen health promotion activity could be considered in the future, in the future. The experience of Rwanda is a positive example of how community health worker can form the basis for 
integrating service delivery at household level and at community level essential to ending preventable child and maternal death. I would like before ending to thank to the Minister of Health of Rwanda for his strong leadership and the commitment to community health worker programming and to the consortium of Kabehomwana. And I would like also to thank all partners in community health in Rwanda. I would like, of course, present my gratitude to USID Rwanda as well as USID Child Survival Health Grant Program. Thank you. Thank you, Melin. So we have learned that we will be going to break promptly at 1 p.m. Um, you will be asked to leave, exit, so that we can come back to the room at 1.10 um, and begin with the ministerial lunch. So we're very disappointed that we're gonna have to cut short and we will not have adequate time for discussion, which we really uh, wanted to have. So once again, I would like to thank all of our panelists and MCHIP leadership for really elevating the community health theme today, today in our conversation and in our celebration of what MCHIP has achieved. Um, our panelists have reinforced some important points that I will review quickly, very quickly. Um, and let's see whether maybe we can take one question at least. Um, but three points that I would like to summarize is first, we have heard that community health approaches are effective and improve equitable coverage for a range of technical interventions. Coverage for these interventions across priority countries remains low or is marked with inequity. So we need to think about how we take the experience and the evidence that we have generated, both process documentation and improvements in population-based outcomes, um, and really how do we translate this into sharpened policies and plans that we are on the brink of developing. This is a different scenario, slightly different scenario than for quality. Um, and MCHIP's work reinforces that a stronger focus and investment in community health can help us save more lives than the estimations we heard yesterday, which were based on the coverage improvements achieved by the best performing countries. So we know that community health approaches can effectively increase coverage of several accelerator behaviors simultaneously with the potential for more dramatic impact such as exclusive breastfeeding, hand washing, and care seeking for childhood illnesses. And as I mentioned earlier, uptake remains low for these across the 24 priority countries. So it's a challenge for us to really think about how, what do we do with the information that we have at hand. Um, we, we also have questions, just like we did for quality, um, and we need to continue to invest in improving implementation science to demonstrate the role of community health approaches in promoting scale, equity, and accountability in local and national systems. And we certainly could benefit from more costing studies. Um, and we hope to tackle some of these things in the new um, project that where we have a robust community and civil society theme um, that has been integrated into that project. Um, second, our toolbox of community health um, includes a range of effective and promising approaches to engage and empower communities. Um, and these enhance the role of communities as producers of health and change agents to improve the functionality and responsiveness of local systems. And I hope um, maybe in the next few years, we will just like we have the maternal vision and the nutrition strategy, we all may be able to work towards a common vocabulary and, and understanding of community health systems approaches um, that USAID is supporting countries uh, to move forward with. And we certainly look to benefit from what countries are doing and incorporate that vocabulary into how we um, try to generate a consistent terminology and vocabulary around this. It's much needed. 
And there are many champions here within USAID, both at the country level and at the headquarter level, who are very interested in trying to move this work forward. We formed a community interest group, and that's just a beginning of our cross-sharing and dialogue. And we have a local systems framework that has been recently approved by the administrator. And so we're, we're even strengthening our linkages across um, our bureau divides. Um, so approaches such as the care groups, household visits by a range of community health agents, community mobilization, peer supervision, two-tiered community health worker systems help us, help us to achieve frequent interpersonal contact with households. This contact is critical for effective re reaching families, promoting behavior change, and creating a space to build community capacity. Community resources and innovation for health are relevant to strengthening the six health systems building blocks and can be tapped into through processes such as microplanning in Bangladesh. Generating and using community level information through participatory processes in local systems remains an important area of work. Are we ready to use this toolbox as we move forward? Um, third, innovative partnerships between government, civil society, and the private sector and vulnerable communities in particular are essential for scaling up locally adapted solutions in community health. These partnerships help us identify assets within communities and local systems for leveraging resources of different types and supporting the technical know-how needed to design, implement, and measure a range of community approaches that foster country and community ownership for health. We've seen across our country programs that this work is gaining greater momentum. It is being scaled up in, through different types of scale strategies, but how do we better coordinate it and harmonize these efforts and really propel the national, the sharpened national policies and plans and make these a, an integral part of those. So our global partnership um, with MCHIP has played an invaluable role in taking our work in community health to the next level by building a strong foundation of thought leadership, and you heard highlights of that today, and action from the local to the global levels, as Koki mentioned when she began, which is so, such an important contribution of MCHIP, to scale up community health with both quality and equity. During the time that um, MCHIP was in operation, uh, we went from about 10 countries in 2004, 2009, um, to about 29 countries in 2014, um, which had permissive policies for integrated community case management. And MCHIP was there, a, a hub, a secretariat for the ICCM task force to help countries with this momentum. It's very exciting, and we hope that that kind of momentum develops for a broader range and a toolbox of community health approaches. So um, I think we're right almost at 1 p.m. We don't have time for questions, but perhaps at the end of the day, we will try to gather, the panelists will try to gather together so that we can have some, um, some dialogue around this. We are very interested in hearing about your experiences in scaling up community health, your thoughts about innovative partnerships, what is it that we need to explore and focus on, and really taking that dialogue um, into our planning processes as we're moving forward with the new project. So thank you very much, and it's been a pleasure to be here today too. Discuss this.